was very different uh, to anything else that was around, I mean, and still is. Uh. She flies like a bird, and I wish that she was mine. She flies like a bird, oh me, oh my. Maggie has been a tremendous success from, the, from a financial point of view because it's, uh, it's always been on this compilation or that compilation. It's been used a lot in lots of different things. Now I know I can't let Maggie go. We walk here. There was potentially more to the band than being just a one-hit wonder. But the fact is, we only had one hit. I can't let Maggie go. I heard a record by um, Love in Spoonful, which I really liked, Daydream. And uh, I thought John Sebastian, very witty writer, and his voice wasn't particularly good. And my voice was pretty awful. Um, so maybe that was the direction we could go in. And I'm lost in a daydream Dreaming about my bundle of joy and a piece of music that I'd been very interested in at the time was um, Mozart's uh, Serenade in E flat, K, I think it's K377. Um, and uh, I'd heard, s s this to me was a very beautiful piece of music. Um, I liked the lightness of it. I can't remember if I did the chorus uh, first or not. Um, she makes me laugh. I think I actually did the verse. She makes me cry. It's a little bit high for me. Uh, with a twinkle in her eye. She flies like a bird in the sky. She flies like a bird. And I wish that she was mine. She flies like a bird. Obviously, we, we knocked it around in rehearsal. I think Pete played it to us, but wasn't 100% sure on the whole sort of arrangement. Um, I know we all threw in ideas, you know, sort of oohs and ahs and middle sections or whatever. I think he finally settled on the name Maggie, but I don't think when we first did it, he wasn't sure actually what the, the title was going to be. Although it's a very simple song, and it's got a very simple, like, back bit. Ta -da. That's pretty simple stuff, but the chorus is not the same as the verse. The verse goes a very different way. So you've got a nice little diminished chord there, but I thought I'd complicate it by adding a slightly dissonant note to it, which naturally comes on again. And I like the idea of a passing chord there. I turned up at the studio and I remember this very, not having the faintest idea, not a, a clue of any sort as to what I would be presented with to play. 
It was fear and trepidation. I had this little um, introduction with it and I could imagine what the oboes would sound like and I could imagine bubbling around under it, a nice little burbly bassoon. And um, a bassoon would just simply follow the chords down. This is the um, original short score, what's called a short score, when you write it out on the piano before you score it for the instruments. And as you can see, there are there's only two staves, so all the instruments are put together as if it's a piano part. And then you work it out um, into um, the various instruments. And you can see these are fading away now, aren't they? <laughs> they really are old. This is the, uh, oh, I think this must be the oboe part. This is the oboe parts. And uh, if we turn over again, we should see something else. This is the bassoon part here. Occasionally, the people that wrote for that sort of combination may not always have had the experience or the training or the knowledge to write in the most comfortable register or in the most playable way for that instrument. So we never knew what we were going to get. Fortunately for Maggie, it was a relatively straightforward session. We did it in one and took the money and went on to the next gig. And um, <clears throat> there's a core anglais part here. For some reason, that's kept in a better condition, although it's got a nicely yellowed look about it. Um, uh, what was it they sold the Beethoven Symphony for? Are they scored three million pounds? Oh, well, I don't think we'll, if we get three quid for that, we'll be doing all right. This is the bit here that goes da 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 at the end, which I was most proud of in the whole thing. That the, I wanted to get a motif doing that, and it sort of worked out nicely. I couldn't hear what the melody line was. All we could hear was jum 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 jum. That's all we could hear, and we were playing our little bits and hoping that it was going to fit, but obviously. The balance engineer with the score in front of him knew that everything was there and the, the, the vocal line was put on afterwards, which was rather interesting. I think it was a Tuesday morning. They'd come to see me in the office in London, in Soho. And we'd finished our meeting and they'd left the office and they'd gone down the stairs and I had a telephone call saying, you'd gone in the charts at 44, because in those days it was top 50, I think. So I rushed to the top of the balcony and looked down and I shouted out, we're in the charts. So they all rushed up the stairs again and um, that was it. And then it slowly built. You know, it went into the top 30, top 20. And here's our first top 20 hit on this week's show. By the Honeybus, their first ever hit, I Can't Let Maggie Go. She makes me laugh, she makes me cry. It stood on its own. It was a bright, summery sound. It was released in the spring. It had a lovely sort of uplifting energy about it. And it was a completely different sound with woodwind. Nobody used woodwind, classical sort of woodwind, on a pop record before, I don't think. By then, all the, the pirate stations were playing it, and it was starting to happen overseas. So there was a lot of, lot of things going on. It would, wasn't just happening in England, it was starting to break out everywhere. We walk here, we walk there. People stop and people stare. Cause she flies like a bird in the sky. She flies like a bird and I wish that she was mine.
Well, I think it was pretty clear from the time that we started doing gigs on the back of the single that we weren't the sort of band that, um, it, that teeny, if you like, screaming kids, teeny boppers of that time, we weren't that sort of band. Um, <laughs> used to be a strange situation where in those days you'd still have curtains at gigs and the curtains would open. And I don't think we, we looked and acted particularly like the usual pop band at the time. So all the kids would come up at us and scream. And uh, often Pete Dello's first words to the audience were, um, welcome earthlings. And I think that sums up the void there was between band and, uh, and the audience. Peter, Pete Dello, who was the, the kingpin, the linchpin of the band, didn't really like touring. He formed Honeybus mainly to be a studio band. But it's very difficult. You have the outside pressures of people saying, look, you know, we've got a hit record here. You've got to go on tour. And, you, you know, they want to see you in Scotland and they want to see you in Wales. And Peter really didn't like it. To be honest, I think we probably had a better time before Maggie uh, as a band because the, there was this great sort of feel uh, of it all happening. Once Maggie happened, it felt as though Pete was putting the brakes on for some reason, like uh, for some reason a gig would be cancelled or no, we're not going to do Holland yet, we're not going to do Europe yet, we're going to wait till um, we've got more hits in the bag and... There were about, I think, three tours of the USA turned down. Terry turned down, basically because Pete Dunne wouldn't go. His personality didn't suit what the success brought. Well, you see, to quote Pete in the newspaper, he, he woke up one morning and didn't want to be in the band anymore. <laughs> Peculiar, though it, it was at the time, I didn't really want to have success. I wanted my life the way it was. Um, I liked to do the things I wanted to do. And I certainly didn't want to be chased around by girls and things like that. And I didn't really want to be doing a lot of sitting in a van and going on long journeys. But also another thing that I hadn't thought of, and it was a very important thing, is that I can live by writing and my royalties because i did the arranging and the artist royalties and the composer's royalties would all be coming through but um you've got a band there and they're not living on royalties only the artist royalties um they need to play to earn the money um so that was where the frustration came in on both sides really i was a reluctant tourer i didn't want to go on tour pete somehow he had such a high opinion of the band. He saw it, and, and himself, I hate to say it, rather above it all. He seemed to have a, a way of appearing above it all. You know, it was all a bit tedious, this pop business, you know. And uh, yes, they probably did feel that uh, there was something peculiar about the fact that I didn't really want to go with this success and roll with it, as it were. But I'm not, I don't, I feel I'm absolutely right. and. Uh, you know, I don't belong to the public and I don't belong to anybody, really. If, if my life is the way I want to go about it, then that's it. Mm. I've looked back at many of my friends who, after years in the business, have become quite dissolute and sort of look as if they really might have prospered a bit more if they'd have taken about 20 years off, you know, of rock and roll. We never really got hold of Pete. Uh, he, he kind of quit the band and kind of broke contact in a way and we got everything sort of via Terry. I don't think I saw Pete actually after he left at all. It, it was a, a strange feeling, you know. But um, there we were, suddenly, in the in the you know middle of it all, all happening. And then, the the main the engine behind the band, Pete, his whole sound, his voice, his skill, his style, which he put on as Honeybus, was suddenly withdrawn. But in a way, it was a chance for them to take over the, the baton, as it were, 
and I think in many ways it brought out a lot of good things because although the Honey Bus wasn't a success after that, um, they, their music is still very much looked at. Um, the, the album they did, Story, which I think was without me, has got some great stuff on it. And I think both Ray and uh, Colin flourished as songwriters because of the, perhaps, you know, they saw that if I could do it, why shouldn't they be able to do it? Watch what you do, what you do, what you say. I'm packing my bags and I'm going away. Wasting my time, losing my mind. I'm gonna leave, better get away fast. What do I need? But somehow, Girl of Independent Means, which was a good single, but it didn't really have the honey bus stamp that, that Pete's sort of sound had with the, with the orchestration and stuff. So we didn't get any luck with that. We pushed on with the album. It was a fairly commercial song, but I think the, the reason of being that long gap and interested Wayne, you know, new kids on the block by that time, and he couldn't afford to um, leave this, that sort of space of time that was left in between singles at that time. Colin was a good writer. Ray was a very good writer. But unfortunately, we were just missing that little bit of magic that the four of them could put together. Three of them with another guy in just didn't quite... The magic, the sparkle had just gone. But in those days, if you didn't have a record, uh, it, it seemed to be, you know, you had to have a record really to get the, get the dates and the, the prestige in a way. So we, we were given the ultimatum by Terry to either carry on without a record and perhaps you just kind of gently sort of slide down or else to pack it in. And I think I, w I would have carried on, but uh, I think Ray had had enough and we basically pulled apart. <laughs> When um, she got um, demoted or rather um, sacked by the Conservative Party, a lot of um, old ladies chained themselves to Downing Street. In fact, I, I've got the photos of it with them all with placards saying, we can't let Maggie go, you know. And it was quite surrealistic actually reading the paper and there's this sort of headlines with this thing coming out, you know. And I, th I remember thinking to myself, is there any royalties in this for me? You know, obviously not. You know. melody that Pete has come up with there is pure romantic composition going back to 19th century. I, I think there is an element of, of maybe late Verdi in there. The, the intervals, the wide gaps in the tune are absolutely remarkable. Um, very singable, but it's, in my opinion, miles better than anything that the Beatles ever did. Can't, but I, I'm sure that that one-off was um, a, a, a piece of creative genius to find that, which is why it stuck in people's ears, which is why it is so singable. She flies like a me, oh my. That that it that leap of that um, diminished seventh is is a uh, absolute thing that all composers are looking for. Why does God give me the gift? to create a piece of melodic inspiration that just probably came at three o'clock in the morning when I was thinking of something better to do. It's absolutely brilliant piece, absolutely brilliant. 
It was a one hit wonder, not because it couldn't have been more, but because historically that's what happened. Um, I'm sure we, we would have gone on to been much bigger than that um, if I'd have allowed the ideas to come forward and the boys were getting so so confident themselves, you know, and I think the formula was right. Um, so, uh, we were maybe more than a one-hit wonder, um, but we were officially a one-hit wonder. And uh, it, does, do I like the term one-hit wonder? Well, it's better than a no-hit wonder, isn't it? And there are plenty of those. I'm a sign writer. I work from here at home and do uh, hand-painted signs, which is something I started doing when I first left school. But I never actually learned to do it properly. I, I do a cabaret circuit. I have a cabaret set. I do a mixed bag of, of 60s, 70s music. Um, I do emulations of Sinatra, Dean Martin, a uh, whole, whole, whole mixed bag of stuff. It's a one-man show, one-man show with sort of lights and costume. And... I still have my publishing company, uh, although I'm not really involved in the music business now. I do therapy work. I do uh, hypnotherapy and psychotherapy where I take people who want to improve their image or their confidence and I help them do this through therapy. Well, I'm supposed to be retired, but anybody that has just retired will find that this is possibly the busiest time of their life. We try and do lots of charity work. My wife bakes lots of cakes. We work for the local church. I do talking newspapers for the blind. I do quite a lot of transcribing and arrangements and cooking up things. I um, teach, teach guitar mainly, um, theory, music theory. We get by without having to do things like retro 60s tours and things like that, which we've been offered and I, the thought of that gives me nightmares. So, you know, um, that's my life today and je ne regrette rien, as they say. <laughs>